How do you get 1 million miles per watt in QRP contacts? Surely that's impossible. But it's not, and there are tricks to do it. Keep watching and I'll give you 7 ideas that can help you get 10,000, 100,000 or even with preparation 1 million miles per watt on amateur frequencies. A million miles per watt is a lot of distance but a little power. What do you do? Increase the distance or cut the power? It's pretty straightforward. The answer, especially if you want to get super high miles per watt, is always to drop the power. And we're talking about getting down to milliwatts, if not microwatts. You can drop power with either a dedicated very low power transmitter or an attenuator connected to your higher power transmitter. However, make sure that, especially if you're dealing with very low amounts of power, there's no leakage that could give you a falsely high amount of power being transmitted. Step two, you now need to think about propagation modes. Certain propagation modes are low loss, others are higher loss you need a low loss propagation mode. And that depends on the third point of choosing a band and frequency. Because different propagation modes are effective at different times on different frequencies. On HF, ground wave is pretty high loss. It doesn't go very far and then the signal's dropped away. A single hop on HF is low loss and therefore suitable for going to small amounts of power but getting high amounts of miles per watt. On higher HF bands and lower VHF bands, there's the possibility of sporadic E-type propagation. That again is very low loss. The thing about it though is that it's not reliable you'll have to get your time of operating just right and be transmitting to the right location just when the propagation is in. On somewhat higher VHF bands, going through to UHF and the microwaves, there's tropospheric propagation. That's often good if you are low down and near the water and there's a good over the water path to the other station. And it's also associated with certain weather conditions, like temperature inversions. We get that most often in southern Australia during the summer. And bear in mind that there are certain distances that are good and not so good. For instance, a distance that's a middling distance where signals skip over, then you're not going to get very good or very low losses with that sort of distance. But further away, that's more optimum for your single hop on HF or sporadic E on higher frequencies, that might be just ideal. Because propagation conditions can be volatile, especially if you're running very small amounts of power, then you may need to try several times before you successfully span a path. Now, of course, I mentioned frequency a little bit before, but not only is there your band you need to think about, but also the exact frequency within that band itself, particularly on HF. You want to be on a frequency that has the least amount of interference. So if it's in the middle of, say, the 14 megahertz band where there's a lot of DX stations, interference from other people that won't necessarily be hearing you, then that's probably a bad choice. Because you'll be running milliwatts or less, you need to pick a frequency that's in the clear. Only experience on HF will teach you the best frequencies in your area and at your time. Location, that's really important. Now I didn't mention microwaves before, but for that you need something really high up with good line of sight type propagation. And of course you can do really well with super low power on microwaves, mainly because the antennas are small, but you can get 
20, maybe 30 dB of gain with something like a horn antenna. Then you can run microwatts and still get surprising distances. And as I mentioned before, when you go down to microwatts, even if you span a distance like 100 kilometers or so, you can still get impressively high miles per watt, or kilometers per watt, if you prefer. On HF, it's not necessarily the very highest spot that may be best. Maybe something nearer the water, preferably nearer salt water. That can help with some low loss paths. See some of my other videos for more information on that, where I commonly work Europe long path with a few watts. And at times I've got to much lower power and still made the distance. Even if you don't have water nearby, another possibility for HF is the side of a hill. If you're on the side that slopes towards where your signal will be taking off, that may, with certain antennas, improve your angle of radiation, so it's optimum for the distance that you wish to span, and thus you may get better results with the milliwatts that you're seeking to use. And then of course there's the antenna itself. For HF, with long distances, you generally want a low angle of radiation. And something like a dipole can be okay, but it needs to be quite high relative to its wavelength to get that low angle. If you've got salt water around, then a vertical right near it, and it doesn't need to be right near it or over it, that can also give you a low takeoff angle. That can be good for DX as well. If you are not seeking the furthest distances, like you might only be seeking a few hundred kilometers, and that's a legitimate strategy, then you don't necessarily need the lowest takeoff angle. In some cases then, a very high antenna may be counterproductive, and even something like a low dipole can be quite good. Getting back to location that I mentioned before, not only do you have to think about the transmitting merit of the site, but also, if you're wanting to do this two-way with another station that is also running milliwatts, you need to think about receiving conditions, and in particular, low noise. That means being away from building and houses and other things that increase ambient RF noise. A quiet location may well have 20, 30 or more dB less noise than one that's urbanised. And that is super, super important when it comes to receiving milliwatt signals from thousands of kilometres away. Then there's mode. I've done a video showing that CW was about 20 times more efficient than SSB. Digital modes are even more efficient, but they don't quite give you the same amount of satisfaction that a voice contact might. So you've got a bit of a trade-off there between voice, morse, and digital modes. Still, nothing wrong with you trying digital modes, even things like Whisper for extremely low power but good performance. And then as you go up, you could then try a mode like JS8, PSK31, then CW, and if signals are strong enough, go up to SSB and still be able to make the contact. So yet yeah, mode can be very important with digital modes being better followed by CW and finally voice. Seventh and final point is timing. You might have everything right, location, frequency, mode, but if the propagation isn't there, then the timing can be way off. That can make a huge difference. And if you're trying very small amounts of power, it's quite difficult sometimes to get the exact time because your optimum propagation might only be for a few minutes. And that's particularly the case for VHF uh, sporadic E. Again, signals can be weak, then they can peak for only a short time and then they subside again. HF, very volatile as well. For a band like 20 meters, your optimum time might only be a span of maybe 15 to 30 minutes, even though if you're running higher power, you might be able to achieve that longer distance path over, say, a two hour period. So, yep, yeah, openings are often a lot shorter with lower power, 
and that's where you've got to get your timing right. You're probably not going to get all this right first time. You might want to start with say 5 watts and then if you succeed in making contacts going down lower and lower. But if you really want achievement then why don't you start with the milliwatts and just try and make as many calls as you can to various stations. In the majority of times they will not hear you but you might get one or two stations that can hear you if you're running say 100 milliwatts maybe even 10 milliwatts first up and that can give you a real buzz and you can also always increase the power if they have difficulty. Um, you're then not getting as much miles per watt but it's still quite a good QRP contact. To summarize, go for lowest power, not longest distance. Think about the propagation mode. You need one that's low loss. Think about the frequency. Some frequencies are better than others for particular propagation modes. Then there's location to consider. High up with good paths for VHF, UHF microwaves lower down near the water for some HF paths. Then there's antennas. You might want to go with something with a good gain antenna, especially if you're doing microwaves. On HF, something like a wire beam gives you a good bang for the buck. Or alternatively, an optimally installed dipole or vertical can still be okay. Then there's mode and also finally timing. I've given seven tips on doing a lot more than you thought with less power than you thought. For more information, have a look at my website, vk3ye.com, or check out my books, hand-carried QRP antennas, and more hand-carried QRP antennas for antennas, or for general QRP operating and equipment, minimum QRP. Search those titles on Amazon, or follow the links on my website, vk3ye.com. And if you've had any super low power experiences yourself, then please share them in the comments below. Okay, great job for 5 watts and uh, 72 seconds for the call. Thank you. No QRP, pussy bound QRP. Right, it was great to work. QRP, 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 pussy bound 5 watts. I am QRP 5 watts, 73.